Hello and welcome to Developing Windows 8 Metro Applications with Embarcadero Prism XE 2.5 and Rim Objects Oxygen for .NET 5.1. My name is Jim McKeith and I'm a developer evangelist for Rim Object Software and I'll be your instructor for this video. So we're talking today about Windows 8 Metro applications, which are accessible here from the Windows 8 Start menu. Metro applications are the new application paradigm that Microsoft is pushing with Windows 8. And they haven't gone so far as to say stop doing desktop development, but they're really encouraging people to do Windows 8 development. For example, they've announced that the Express editions of Visual Studio will only support Metro application development. Uh, the advantage of Metro Metro applications is that your Metro application will run on both Windows 8 tablets as well as Windows 8 desktop. All the new features, all the new development effort from Microsoft is pushing into Windows 8 Metro. So very important to be aware of this, determine if it is suitable for your applications you're gonna be developing. Another advantage of Metro applications is that they are available through the Windows Store. The Windows Store will be installed on all Windows 8 tablets and desktops. So if you think about how many desktops today are win running Windows and how many will be upgrading to Windows 8 or buying new computers with Windows 8 on them, all of those will have access to buy your app through the Windows Store. This is a, a great opportunity to get your app distributed to a very large number of people. So let's talk real quick about the Windows 8 platform. At the base, it's still running Windows kernel services, but there are two different application development paradigms. So let's go ahead and talk about the, the existing desktop apps, which are all still available on Windows 8. You have your unmanaged apps, which are written as C, C++, or Delphi. These all run on the Win32 API. Then you have your managed applications written in C Sharp, VB.NET, Oxygen, of course, your favorite .NET programming language. And all of these run on either Silverlight or the .NET framework. And finally, of course, you have your web applications. These are developed using HTML or JavaScript, and they run in the browser. They interact with the DOM. They're uh, a different API as well. So you have these three different types of desktop applications, each one using a different API, different uh, calls you're going to make to do the same sort of functionality. A button is different on all three platform, for example, or how you would, would make different calls to the OS. So the new type of development is, of course, the Metro style apps. Now, right away, the difference is they all use the same APIs. The Windows Runtime, the WinRT APIs is the same and consistent across all Metro applications. And so these WinRT APIs replace Win32.NET, Silverlight, the browser, etc. Now, of course, the browser is still available in Windows Metro. There is a Met Windows Metro version of Internet Explorer, but the uh, as far as Metro style apps, they all use this API. So you have your unmanaged applications written with C or C++. You have managed applications written in C Sharp, VB, or Oxygen and you have JavaScript applications written in JavaScript. Now, all three of these are available for developing Metro applications, and all three of these use the Win Runtime APIs. Because they're all using the same APIs, it's really up to the developer to choose which language either they're most familiar with, or if one of the languages provides some sort of advantage for the particular app they're developing. So for example, if you have some legacy C or C++ code, then it would make most sense to use an unmanaged C or C++ to develop your application. So then you can pull in that legacy code that you're using in your existing application. Or if you are wanting to take advantage of the functional nature of JavaScript, there might be a reason you'd want to use JavaScript for your application that you're developing in Metro. And if you are an Oxygen developer, then you can still use your favorite language here in managed Metro applications. And these, of course, have the advantage of getting the full .NET framework, as well as the managed memory management and optimization that come from using a managed application. Now, there are two different options for the user interface. If you are doing a managed unmanaged application, then you develop your user interface in XAML. XAML was previously used in WPF or Silverlight. And if you're developing a JavaScript application, then your user interface will be developed with uh, HTML and cascading style sheets. Now, one note is that if you're using either user interface paradigm, you're still going to have a metro look and feel on your application. Now, of course, you can do whatever you want to with your look and feel, but by default, you're still gonna have access to the same 
user controls and the same look and feel. So the user is not going to say, oh, I'm in a JavaScript application using HTML and cascading style sheets. They're not going to know that. In the Windows Store, they're all presented level playing field, and the user interaction is not going to know what kind of application they're using. So really, it comes down to choosing the application paradigm that makes the most sense for you. Do you want to go managed, unmanaged, or JavaScript? All three produce the same sort of applications. There's no limitations between one or the other. So remember, all of these are creating native Metro applications. And by native, I mean a native user experience. They're all user natively, or the user feels like they're in Metro. They're not feeling like they're being pulled out into some sort of user interface. And from a developer's point of view, we have access to the native win RT APIs. There's no abstraction layer. There's nothing getting in our way of doing exactly what we want to do, develop a Metro application. So all three are native Metro applications. There's no reason to always choose one or the other. It's a matter of choosing the one that makes most sense for you or most sense for the application you're developing today. So specifically right now, we're going to focus on developing managed Metro applications using Oxygen and a XAML interface. Support for Windows 8 Metro development was added in the May update of Embarcadero Prism XE 2.5, which of course is powered by RimObjects Oxygen for .NET 5.1. While Windows 8 and Metro is under development, we will continue to update our support, so always be sure you are using the latest version. Rest assured, as soon as Windows 8 is released, we will have finalized support. Since we are regularly improving the Oxygen for .NET compiler, it is always a good idea to use the latest version. If you purchased Oxygen for .NET as part of Rad Studio or Embarcadero Prism, then you'll want to register your serial number with RimObject software so you'll have access to the latest betas and the latest versions directly from us. I'll show you how to do that. You also need Windows 8 and Visual Studio 2012. These are both currently in release candidate status. The demos and examples in this video were created with the consumer preview and beta, but they are still fully applicable for the release candidates and I expect them to be applicable for the final releases as well. Until Visual Studio 2012 is released, you will need to download the full version of Visual Studio 2012. The Oxygen for .NET compiler will not work in the Express Edition. You need the Professional Edition or better. It is a free download until Visual Studio 2012 is released. Once that happens, we will include the Visual Studio Shell with Oxygen for .NET. Windows 8 is a free download from Microsoft while it is in release preview status. Metro development is only supported on Windows 8, since Metro apps run on the Windows runtime. There are no plans to port WinRT to Windows 7. Just visit these URLs here at the bottom of the page to download Windows 8 and Visual Studio 2012. So I'm going to show you real quick on how to grab all these tools so that you, you know what you're looking for and how to find them. The first thing we're going to look at is how to register your Prism XE 2.5 serial number so that you can get the May update. So you go to rimobjects.com and you can, uh, of course, while you're here, look at more information about Oxygen, which is the language that powers Prism. But what you're here for is you need to come to support. And if you scroll down on the support page, you see here it says get support for Prism XE2 or later. Now if you come down here and click register your product serial number and then provide your Prism XE2.5 serial number, that will register your serial number with RimObject software. Now what that gives you is two things. First of all, it lets you get support from RimObjects, um, the makers of Oxygen for .NET, the language that powers Prism. It also gives you access to beta and gamma updates for Prism. So when you click this register, you're going to have to create an account with RimObject software if you don't already have one. If you do, log into that account, and then there'll be a spot where you can enter your serial number. Once you've done that, then you'll have access to the betas and gammas. And so remember, you need to get the May update to Prism XE2. So then, once you have that, then you need to come here to msdn.microsoft.com slash windows, and you need to get... Windows 8 Consumer Preview. So just go here, you can download the ISO and create a, uh, either burn that to a DVD to install on your desktop or mount the ISO in your virtual machine in order to uh, install Windows 8. You can also come down here and if you go to uh, this 
Metro Style Apps homepage, there is a good, uh, some documentation and developer guide here that's worth checking out that's going to have a lot of information about Metro in general. So I'm not going to go into a lot of these details. So you're going to want to come out here and read this in order to get an overview of Metro. So I'm going to assume that you have an idea of what Metro is and why you're doing it. And we're going to talk about how to do it with Oxygen for .NET. And then finally, you need to get the Visual Studio 11 beta. You can download the beta from here. You don't need to be an MSDN subscriber. If you come here to download the beta, you can download Visual Studio Ultimate. Actually, any of these three versions will work, but you might as well download Ultimate. Um, I guess it would be smaller to download just professional. And depending on the kind of down, uh, pipe you have, um, the web installer will just download the parts it needs, whereas the full ISO um, download it once, and that way you can install it multiple times if you need to. Okay, so install Windows 8 first, then Visual Studio 11, and finally, after you register your serial number, you can install Prism XE 2.5, and you're ready to go. Welcome to Windows 8. This is the screen you get when you first log in. This is the start screen and the Metro interface. We have a combination of Metro applications, that's these large tiles here with the uh, these kind of graphics on it and then you have desktop applications which have the addition the traditional icon here on a uh, different size tile so you can uh, interact with the tiles right click or left click to launch it if you left click to launch it it takes you to the desktop if it's a desktop application um, to get back to the start menu is the start button or in the lower corner right here click so characteristics of a Metro application is they are full screen and they're completely focused on the content. So in this case, it's all about weather, a background, what the weather looks like outside in case I don't have a window and content in here could be interactive. Click on that. Now it has a video playing. And if I want to get to uh, less used controls or, um, settings, I get that through right click. And this brings up my toolbars, these are called app bars in here. So I can uh, go to places, change my temperature, scale, whatever. So those are a few characteristics of Metro apps. I'll go back to Fahrenheit so I'm not confused later. Also, we have these updating tiles here. The recently used apps are over here on the right. So in the top corner, I get the last app I was in. And if I scroll down, I can see other apps and the desktop is an app. Also, we have uh, charms, which is over here on the right. You can get to that through a swipe with the mouse or Windows C. And from here, you can actually do a search of, uh, for example, a stock. Since I'm in the finance, I can search for stock and jump straight to the Microsoft stock. Okay. You can grab an app from the top like this, drag it all the way to the bottom to close it. Otherwise, it just goes away. It goes behind when I switch to a different app. And eventually, if there's memories needed or whatever, it will get closed from there. So it, it kind of manages the memory of the app, the lifecycle of the map automatically if you're not using it. But if you are wanting to terminate it completely, just take it and drag it all the way to the bottom like that. And now it's completely gone and it's not over here anymore. So let's go ahead and make our first Metro application. We just go ahead and launch Visual Studio. And we say, new project. Under templates for oxygen for .NET, we just select the Metro and Metro application. So this has created an empty application from the Metro template. I'm gonna go walk you through what the different parts of this and show you how they all work so you know your way around here. We have two XAML files here. We have the app.xaml and the main page.xaml. The app.xaml, actually we'll start with the main page. Main page.xaml is the main form of your application, the main window, the main UI that you're going to work with. Then on the app.xaml is a place where you can put resources or things you want to have available to other uh, pages in your application. So there's no user interface associated to this. This is a place where you can define um, some uh, application across across all application settings for it. 
for example, styles and themes can be put here. And then behind each of these XAML files, you'll see there's a .pass file. So we have a app.xaml.pass. This is the main entry point for your application. So for example, there's a uh, method here on launched where you can have the uh, stuff that happens on launch of the application before the main page is created. And then in the main page .xaml.pass is the code behind the main page. This is where you're gonna have your event handlers. Also here, there is a package.appx manifest. This is specific to Metro. This is what describes your application to Windows 8. So a couple things in here to be aware about is this identity name. This uniquely identifies your application. If this name is the same in multiple applications, then as you install each new one, it replaces the existing one. Down here, this images store logo references an image in this folder here, images. Um, so images, images, and then the name of it. This is the logo that would appear for your application. You can come over here and change these logos, put do graphics in, call them whatever you want to call them, as long as this update is updated correctly. And then down here, we have uh, some additional visual elements. For example, here's the splash screen, which is also over here, splash screen. So you can change that. And then lastly, I want to point out to you right now is capabilities. So capabilities are where essentially you request the permissions that you want your application to have. So we say capability, and then go to name, what name we want to reference. And so for example, if we want to access removable storage, we specify that here. And that's because Metro applications, because they're coming through an app store, this gives it a way for to describe what the application is capable of doing. So the user can judge you know, what level of trust they want to grant the application. So that is the package.appx manifest. So let's go ahead and add a little functionality to our application here. So we'll go to the main page XAML. Now in here, you can edit the XAML directly or you can edit up, drag things over and edit them here, edit properties. I'm gonna show you some things in the XAML. Um, as you edit in any place, they all update together. So the user control is the root node that says this is a user control. Um, you can also use page, two different options. There's a couple subtle differences. We'll see uh, those in a couple applications where you'd use one over the other. Then you have the layout root. So in XAML, you have these different layout controls that control the way things are laid out. So grid is the default one in here. One I really like is stack panel. Stack panel uh, has a horizontal or vertical orientation, and then it just stacks all the controls on the one on top of each other. I've changed the root node to a stack panel, and I want to come in here and add a text box. A text box is just user entry point. So you'll notice it put it all the way across, and it's at the very top. That's because it's a stack panel. That's what stack panels do. If I want to bump it down a little bit, I can say margin 10. And now it's got a margin of 10 from the top of the screen. I can edit, like I said, from here, I can come up here and edit as well, or I can come over to here and edit it. So I want to give it a name so I can interact with it from the code. We'll call it text input. And next thing we want to do is add a button. So I can show you here, I can add a button from the XAML button. And we don't need a name on the button. We do need a content of click me and we'll give it a width of auto. So this should make it just as wide as it needs to be. So there we go, there's our button, click me. And I can put a margin of 10 on that as well. And lastly, we need a text block. A text block is a uh, text output functionality. So we're gonna give a name of uh, text output. And a content, no, no, it's text of your text appears here. Oh, text block, text 
lock, not text box. Okay, so there we go there. Um, we could, I'll show you here, we can come over here and say, let's give that a different font and we'll set it to uh, 22, so there's a little bigger. Okay, so we've created some controls here. Let's go ahead and add a little interactivity on it. We can add an event handler to our button, either through the code here, through this um, event handler. I can double click there. I'll show you how to do it through, I'll just double click on the button. You can notice down there it added the to the XAML, the click event handler. So now we're in the code behind the main page XAML.pass, and we're gonna add some code in here. Now, right away you'll notice that when I go here, it doesn't have my text uh, input or output. And the reason is because I haven't compiled yet. And so if you are working with it and you do something and it's not there yet, it's because it hasn't compiled it because there's some generation that goes on behind the scenes where it generates code based on the XAML. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit compile real quick. And now I can come here and say text output dot text equals text input text. So this, this line here is yellow because the, the framework specifies object with an O, but the correctly should be uppercase O. So it's just saying, hey, you might want to fix that. It's up to you if you want to or not. You can turn that off at the function feature that's optional. So there we go. We're just going to set the output text to the input text and we're ready to run our application. So now I can click in here and say, hello world, and then click the click me button and there it appears. So we see we're in a Metro application. You saw the splash screen there for a split second when the application launches and the Met application runs full screen, the default behavior. Obviously, incredibly simple application. Let's take a look at some more um, robust applications, some of the more things you can do with Metro. So when I'm done, I can hit the up in the upper right-hand corner, there's Visual Studio, and pop back into there again. Or I could use the Start button, Desktop, Visual Studio. Okay? Okay, this is one of the examples that I've created for Prism development with Metro. This is the app bar example. I'm gonna go ahead and run it here. Once you see it running, then I'll explain what's going on. So the content is in here. This content is not very interesting, but the idea is all your content should be on the canvas. And then that bar is where all your buttons go. So one thing about this app bar is by default, when you right click, it appears. And then if you click or left click or right click in the canvas area, it goes away again. But sometimes you want your app bar to stick around. And so I've exposed a property here so that you can then change this. You can do this in code or however you want to do it. And so now this top app bar is sticky. So when I click in here, the bottom one goes away, but the top, top one stays. And I can bring it back, unclick that, and they both go away. Okay, so how do we do this? First of all, the main element here is a page instead of a user control. So a user control has the ability of being able to be embedded in other page or user control, but a page has some conditional characteristics like the ability to define app bars, kind of a top app bar and a bottom app bar. You just define those in here. You can also define them over here. If you don't have one yet, you can hit the new button here and that will create a new app bar for you in your, in your uh, page. Inside the app bar, you add whatever controls. So this has a grid in order to create this layout. So we have two columns, 50% each one, so here's one column, here's the other column, and then some stack panels in those columns to contain the controls. You can put any controls you want to in the app bar. You're not limited to uh, buttons or checkboxes or anything like that. You're pretty flexible. You can put whatever you want to up here as far as how to get the layout. One thing I will point out is that the buttons use a style. Now, these glyphs are not uh, graphics, they're not in my images folder here. Instead, they come from the style, which brings them in from a font. So let's take a look at that style. The these are all defined in the standard styles XAML file here. And if we do a search for star app button style, there we go. This is a style, you can look at the rest of this code later, but this is how it sets styles is you have this thing where you say setter. First of all, you say what it targets, so it targets a button. And then also this is based on an existing style that's defined up above. And then that style defines which font and stuff like that. So the stuff that's consistent across all app bar buttons is in that base style. 
This one says that the we have an automation ID and a name, which are unique to this one, star, at bar, button, and star, and then the content. So this odd hexadecimal looking thing here is actually a character from the uh, a specific font. So if we go into char map, this uh, font here, this Sego UI symbol, is the font that you want to pull all your glyphs from. So if you come out here to the bottom, we can see here's all the different glyphs. So here's a camera, um, whatever you want to have is available in here. Or most of the stuff you're going to want to have is available here. This is so this is the default location you should go to get your glyphs. The, and this matches the theming across all apps. Of course, you can don't have to follow that theming exactly if you don't want to. But once you find the glyph you want, down here at the bottom, E one two B. So you just replace that part there with E one two B, and you'd have a different glyph there. So actually, we can do that E one two B. And so now, if we go back to main page, we see now we have a different glyph here. So I'm a little bigger. So now it's a, a little globe there. So. That shows you how that works. Let's change that back. Then you also can define, since these are regular buttons, you define a click click event on it. So that's the checkbox has a click event. And then all the other buttons have this app bar click. And the app bar click, we'll take a look at that code, looks at the, so, take, so this all click event handlers get a sender with an, with an object. And so we just cast that sender as a button and we get the tag off of it. And so if we look back in here, oops, in here, we'll see that the tag says star. So each one has a tag defining what that button is. The tag can be anything you want it to be. And so in this case, we're just going to display a message dialog that says what uh, button they clicked. Now, I'll show you the message dialogs here. So I create this new message dialog object, and then I add a couple of buttons to it. If I don't add any buttons, it just has one OK button. But I'm going to add two commands, OK and again. And then this right here is what you need to be aware about in time you're doing anything that could block the main UI thread. Metro has a very strict rule about not blocking the main thread, the UI thread. If you block it for any period of time at all, it will uh, can kill your app for you. So don't block the UI thread. Now, luckily, they added a lot of functionality into the framework to make it really easy to not accidentally block the UI thread. So for example, here, we're using the show async. Now show async is going to show the dialog and then not block the thread. It's going to show another thread and then let allow this to keep the code to continue running. But we want to evaluate the result of this show async, this command we're going to get back to determine which um, button they clicked. Okay, so if we just spawn this in another thread and it would just keep going and this code would run without having received got command back, which would fail. So that's where this await keyword comes in. Await is just really amazingly cool uh, programming here. The, the amazing language feature. What await does is it allows this code to not execute until this show async finishes, but it doesn't block the thread that it's in. So the thread keeps going, but then it knows that this code gets evaluated after show async finishes. So it allows us to write our code as if it's not doing an async call, but get the functionality of asynchronous calls. So just amazing stuff here. You There is no show without an async on here, so you have to do show async. Um, but then if I took the await off, then I wouldn't be able to get the command that it wouldn't it would give me an error message down here. So that wouldn't work. So you notice here, I'm just doing a message dialog with show async. And I'm not doing an await because I don't care to wait for the results on that. So different different options, different ways of doing things. So I'll go ahead and run this again. And you can see the message button in action. So I click any of these and it says at bar button refresh clicked. And if I hit OK, it goes away. But if I hit Again, it displays a second dialog there. So that's the await in 
action there. So anytime you're doing anything, file system operation, network operations for sure, anything computationally expensive, or uh, in this case, blocking for user input, you need to use asynchronous and wait if you wanna get the results back. Very important. Oh, let me show you the code for the sticky, it's right there. So the top app bar is the name of the app bar that's on top, and you just set the is sticky to true. So you could set this to true um, automatically in your app when the app bar appears, for example, or by default, and always have your app bar be sticky, or you can do like I did and put a checkbox in there that when the user checks it, it makes the app bar sticky. So lots of things you can do to get those app bars to behave exactly the way you want them to. Here's another example that is included here with Oxygen. This is the show search functionality. So uh, you can get to the charms bar with a mouse movement or a swipe, or you can use Windows key C, brings up the charm bar on the side here, or you can use Windows key Q to go straight into search. So search is all handled through this charms bar. You don't add a search button in your app. Typically there are some exceptions the developer guide talks about why when you would have search in your app versus in the charm bar. But the nice thing about eating in the charm bar is I can actually be in a different app. So for example, I could be in the store and I could do a search for uh, Delphi and say, oh, you know what? I wanna look in the Metro search application. And so it shows here that this the app was activated here with the search term Delphi. And so this gives your app an opportunity to respond to the search. Also, if your app has focus, then you have additional functionality here. So for example, as I type Delphi, my app provides suggestions here. Um, I can do uh, Java and get suggestions for Java, um, .NET, et cetera, uh, Oxygen, and it gets the suggestions. So the app is providing suggestions. And also if you notice over here, as I'm typing in the search bar, it updates, it gets callbacks to the app itself. So the app knows what the user's typing in. So you could have the suggestions appearing in your canvas area. So a lot of incredible functionality here available through the search and uh, it creates this unified place for people users to search and then your app can then respond to that. Very cool stuff that you can do. So let's take a look at how all this works. So going in here to Visual Studio and we're gonna go into the main page, xaml.pass. So I have a suggestion list. This is just a string list that I've used to produce the suggestions. It can be anything you wanna do. The key here though, is we get the search pane for the current view. And we just keep a hold of that. And this is how we interact with the uh, search term. So once we have that search pane, we here had add an event handler on that for different situations. So when a query is submitted, when the query changes, so this is when we know that the uh, user's typing a query, we can get notification automatically. When the search pane is requesting suggestions, this is what we the uh, event that happens there, and this gives us an opportunity to pat, give return suggestions. And then if they click on one of the suggestions there, you get a different event than if it's query submitted. So different uh, things, events you wanna handle there. I think this is all the events you're probably gonna deal with except for one more on the main page app XAML. There is this on search activated that you wanna override as well. And this one is we get a uh, event when the, our app's not the one at focus and they click on it over on the left, which is the first thing I showed you there. And then this is the event handler here. And so in this case, I'm just passing the information to the main page so that the main page can display what the user selected. Before we look at the code some more, one really important thing is we have to go to our app, our package app X manifest. Now in here is an extension. So an extension is a way of telling the operating system what additional functionality we're gonna have in our application. So in this case, we say we support search. And so this is what allows it to show up in the search bar over here. Okay, if we did not have that, we would not show up over here. Okay, so that's important there. And then once we have that, then it gives us the ability to uh, receive the event on search activated. So if we don't have this extension, we will not receive ever receive the on search activated, whether we've coded it or not. Now, if we have that extension there and we don't code this, then 
we won't be able to respond to that when the user clicks on it. So two things you have to do there to support that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code in here for the event handlers. The query submitted, all I'm doing, we just get a uh, arguments here and the argument has a query text, we're just displaying that. Same thing on query change, we just get a argument that has the current query text as they're typing it before they've submitted it. But then when they requesting suggestions, all we do is on the R arguments, there's a request object and we just uh, access the search suggestion collection and append a query suggestion. Now, there only is ever five that are displayed over there at a time. So in this case, we're just stopping after we've suggested five. But if you maybe you're going to suggest the top five or something like that, so you can change this so that it only uh, you need to optimize this so that the five that show up are the five that makes the most sense to the user. And then here again, on a suggestion chosen, we just get an arguments with a tag the tag being the suggestion that was chosen from those. So that's it. That's all there is to it to make you respond to search. Really cool functionality that is uh, creates this unified experience to the user and really quite easy to implement in your application. This application does a few different things. This example does. I want to show you all of what they do and then explain how that works in code. First of all, all apps support what's called snap view. So if you grab it at the top here and drag it to the side, either side, you see that bar that appears when I release it, it's going to show up in snap view. What this app does differently though, is it actually responds to the fact it's in snap view and changes its layout. So it does that by switching from a grid view to a list view and then changes the orientation of this and adds this unsnap button. So the unsnap button gives you the ability to programmatically unsnap the app back into fill view again, or full view. So there's different views that are available. You have the snap view, which can be on either side. So let's see, snap view on this side. You unsnap it by dragging it out like this. And you can actually combine, let's see, let's put this in snap view and go to the desktop. And so now I have my snap view Metro app visible at the same time as my desktop. So this would be a great use case for a dashboard application or a Twitter application, something like that the, the user always wants to have present on the screen while they're doing other work. So you can have this snap view available here. So the key takeaway from this is your Metro app will probably end up being a snap because the user can snap any app they want to. So you need to make sure your app responds to that appropriately by changing the layout. Otherwise, it's going to look kind of goofy when it's in that narrow view without being able to um, lay things out differently. The other thing is, like I said here, this is a, uh, a grid view and a which then converts to a list view. Oh, so if the desktop is in snap view, it looks like this and just shows you the various apps that are there. Not very useful. By the way, these boxes you'll see, each time you're running a Metro app in debug mode, you'll see these boxes show up. Um, so yeah, you'll just see those. They go away when the Metro app goes out of memory automatically. This grid view responds to clicks and then displays the item that's clicked down here at the bottom. It also reserve, preserves its state. So it... Um, remembers what item you selected. And then when the app goes out of memory, gets pushed out of memory, it will then save that state. And then when it comes back in again, it looks and it has that state preserved, it'll bring it back. So that's a really cool feature that you're gonna to wanna to make sure you implement in your apps because your app could get pushed out any time. So one note about this is that in a, what we think of traditional desktop applications, we have a save button, right? And so we save when we want to preserve the information. But the reality is your app should always save its state. It should know where it's at because on a traditional desktop application, you could lose power, the computer could crash, whatever, and the user would lose their information. And so most desktop applications now do some sort of state save automatically in order to support res uh, resuming the data, recovering the data. So Metro apps just take that to the next level in that you want to do that automatically because your app could get pushed out at any time and uh, go away. So you wanna make sure that you have that functionality in there so that your app remembers what state it was in if it gets pushed out. And so what happens is if you switch to a different app, so I'm gonna switch back to Visual Studio, your app is over here, gonna show up on the side here. And when it's memory is needed, these apps can get pushed out of memory. Okay, now 
if they get pushed out of memory and then the user clicks on them again, then it needs to be able to restore its state to come back in again. So once it's gone off to the side here, it could go away at any time, but may not necessarily go away right away. So that's some people have a hard time with that, but it's really, it just lets the OS manage your memory for you. If you write your app correctly, so to manage a state, which is really a good thing you should be doing all along, it's completely seamless to the user. So let's look at how this is implemented in code. First thing here is we want to register a uh, view state changed event handler. And that's what this is here. We just get the uh, application view, get for current view, view state changed, and then add a, a view state change handler. So this is what will be called every time our application's view state changes. I'll come back to the rest of the code in here later. The on view state change event, what it does is it takes, looks at the view state, and then calls the visual state manager and tells it to switch to a different state. Now the visual state manager is actually defined in the XAML here. So if we look inside of our layout root, our stack panel that's at the, the root of the page or the user control in this case, it has this visual state manager, visual state groups defined. And so we have, um, we say portrait and full are just the default, use the default layout that is the way it's designed at runtime. But then for fill or snapped, it does a slightly different layout. And so we use what these are a series of storyboards here. And so this says the detail stack panel, we're gonna change the orientation to horizontal. The uh, layout route, we're gonna change the margin. The data grid view, we make visible when we're in fill. But then the data list view, we make invisible, which is collapsed when we're in fill. So that way, the both those views are there, but one is hidden and one is not. There's other ways you could do this in code if you'd rather, but this is the way for this example, I've done this. Um, so those are the different states you go through here with the different things, changing them or however you want to do that. And then here it is for snap is uh, essentially you know, just a little bit different, uh, different here for the uh, data grid view goes to collapsed the um, list view, data list view goes to visible and the various things change. So you can look at this code to kind of see how this is laid out, but you basically specify what the storyboard targets, what property it targets, and then you set the value for those properties. And you can, you edit this, you're gonna edit this both, mostly likely in XAML, but you'll notice over here, it actually has a property editor here and you can see you can edit the properties there so that way if you're not sure what the values of visibility are you can click here and there's your two options available to you generally if you mess up the xaml if there's an error in your xaml then this property editor will quit showing up and so it's useful as you're editing this to click and see if this is reflecting correctly if this stops updating stops refreshing or doesn't re reflect what you defined here then you've got an error in your xaml usually it's you know you misspelled something and it's like oh yeah silly me and you can fix that easily so that's how you uh, create the ability to have your app respond to different uh, view states. The programmatic unclick is right here, the unsnap button click. And so all you do is call application view try unsnap. And so it returns true or false. And so we just keep track of that to know if we successfully unsnapped or not. And then we just display that to the user. This update text view state is the little text up the top you saw that tells you, displays to the user what view state you're in. So if you wanted to programmatically change your layout to some way or another, you could do that in a method like this, where we just check our current state. And if our current state is uh, snapped, we could then maybe add controls, remove controls, or you know spawn whole new processes. So whatever you wanted to do to respond to the state change, you can do that. So the uh, the grid and the list view, let me go ahead and scroll down here, have a template assigned to them, an item template. So the item template is defined in our app XAML. And it just defines what data binding we're using here. So this is a really convenient way to data bind. So it says that our, uh, inside each item is a stack panel. And that stack panel has an image and has uh, 
three text blocks and the image is bound to the image property of the object. Static resources, or the, I'm sorry, the, the text blocks are defined to the, uh, bound to the, the title, the, um, Oh, sorry, that's the style that's being defined too. That's why I was getting confused. There we go, right here. Binding is, is bound to the title, the category, and subtitle. So this is a way, where basically what you do here is you define the controls that are embedded in the grid view or list view. So this template is defined once and then used in both list view and grid view. Okay, so the item template is item template. See that exact same template is assigned in both of those. So that's a really convenient way so that they look the same in both situations. Uh, so let's say you do data binding. Oh, and then as far as loading the data in here, I handle this up at top. So this uh, data source is just an object that contains a static collection of uh, data, but this could be data if you bought in from any source uh, directly from a database. It's a less likely scenario. Most likely scenario is going to pull it in from a solution like Data Abstract for it's a multi tier database solution. So you're going to pull in your data. Um, in this case, I'm just doing a sort on it, sorting it by category, and then assigning it to the two item sources. So the grid view and the list view both have an item source property, and you just assign the data to that. Um, this right here looks is the suspension manager, which manages the state. And I'll show you the code for that. It's over here. And we look in the state to see if we have the item key. So the item key is just a constant that we use to remember. It's a name value pair that we store in this suspension manager. And if we do have the item key, then we're going to pull it out and we're going to look it up in our data and find that item and then select it and put it in current item and then update the item display. So that just updates the display at the bottom to show that we remembered which item was selected last time. That's, let's see, so down here is the data item clicked, just uh, gets the current item, the clicked item from the object that was sent to it here. So the uh, one of the arguments is clicked item and then we know which item was selected. And then we just update the item display, which just displays current item. So current item was either obtained through clicking in the list view or grid view, or it was obtained by restoring the state. And then down at the bottom, we have a, a URL that they can click on to go to the website for more information. Oh, let me show you the state manager. So I called the state manager. You can just use this session manager again in your code, and you don't have to worry about trying to change it. The uh, I will show you, actually, before I go into here. In here, on our launch, we... Um, Suspension, man sus suspension manager, we call restore async. And so we're calling a wait on this. We're not getting a result back, but we don't want to display the main page until we finish restoring the uh, session. And then on suspend, we save async. And we do need to uh, get a deferral on the suspension operation. So this is other operations going on. We can then call those when we're done. So we uh, save async and then do deferral complete to say we've, we're finished our process of uh, saving our station. Uh, in here, there is on the click, where's that? Right here, suspension manager session state. This is where we add something to the session state. So this adds it to the session state that's in memory. And then when the on suspending occurs, that's when it saves that session state to disk. So anything you want to save, you have to add it to the session state here with the key there's a key value pair. And then when the session state gets persisted, it all gets written out. So let's take a look at the suspension manager. The essentially it's just a, uh, a static class. So it has session state and you can poke something in the session state and then the save async um, gets the output stream, writes it out, saves it out, flushes it. You can read through this. Pretty straightforward what it's doing um, once you understand the way things work. Okay, so that is the, the snap example showing uh, how to re redo your layout, how to preserve your state, and also data binding. This example shows how to update your tile and respond to notifications. So 
on the start menu, this is our tile here. So you notice that right now it's updating. It's uh, displaying a number that's counting up and occasionally displays a glyph at random just to show you the possibilities of what you can do there. But then we can also, so then from our app itself, if we click on the app, in here in the app, we can set the title to uh, Hello Metro. Set tile. And we go back to the start menu. And now it says Hello Metro. We can uh, also clear that out. So then I go back here and it goes back just the default one with just the icon there. We can also uh, set an image. So this pulls an image out of the resources and displays it in there. So if we go in here, now it switches to this other kind of a larger looking graphic here. And also point out that you can change the size of the tile. So you know some of these are smaller and you can resize this one here and go to larger. So things you can do there. And also we can use a web image. So this is actually going to pull an image down off the internet and display it on the tile, which is kind of cool. So it takes a second to hit the internet server. And there we go. We have an image displayed off the internet. So there's different, one thing about this tile is it looks like there's different elements here and there is, but it is one hit target. All right. So I can't have a different thing happen clicking here than clicking elsewhere on this. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the code for how this all works. One thing is that this uses this notifications extensions, which is uh, provided by Microsoft here. You could rewrite this in Oxygen, but I've just left it in C Sharp. There's a few different notification extensions in here that you can call. But this application calls this other assembly here uh, to, to take care of that. So you're probably going to want to leverage this, although, like I said, you could recreate this or modify it however you want to as well. In our main page, XAML, we have the code to um, do the different things here. First of all, I'm using a dispatch timer here. And then this dispatch timer calls timer click every second. And uh, down at the bottom here. And this is what I'm using to display the number that's counting up or a glyph at random. So just every random one in three times, it displays a glyph, a random glyph. Otherwise, it displays the count. And so the way this works is we create a new notification content. So this is a glyph notification content or numeric notification content. And then we call the badge update manager, passing in our badge content and we say create a notification. And so that sends that notification to our tile or uh, badge update manager, which then updates our tile. So I'll just go ahead and show the, uh, We'll do the image one here. So this is the one that displays the image. So here we create a, uh, a tile or tile wide image and text notification, as well as a, a tile square image notification. So we update both the wide and the square. Those are two different uh, images in there. And so this uses an image out of here. We have uh, different images here. And we'll point out that depending on the resolution of the screen you're running on, it will use different images. Okay. So depending on the screen resolution, it uses different uh, uh, pixel density images, essentially. And so you name your images like this, and it will pull that automatically. Because here I'm just calling it red wide. I don't include the scale. And that selects the correct scale automatically. Um, so then the... We call the, uh, here it is, the tile update manager and create update for application update. And then we pass in the tile content create notification, which displays the tile, updates the tile. Uh, in order for your app to display the wide um, tile, or you have the option to switch between wide and narrow tile. That's actually defined in your package app manifest here. And if we scroll down here, there's added here this uh, default tile with the wide logo. OK, so you just add the wide logo and then what image you want to display. And then if you have that, then you will have both the wide and narrow logo options or wide and narrow tile options. I think that's everything. Now, this one does need the Internet client because we are getting the uh, the web image here, 
which pulls it from that URL that we defined. So one thing about notifications, there is not a notifications area like in other OSs that notifications stay. Your tile is responsible for displaying the notifications and keeping track of all the notifications and dealing with those notifications. There is not a, a separate notifications area like, um, for example, iOS or Android has a, a notification box that holds all your notifications until you deal with them. So the idea is that when the user comes in here to the uh, start screen, they will see, oh, hey, I've got 99 messages, 99 whatever I need to deal with, or some sort of glyph here or whatever. So they know what they need to do in order to uh, get the updates from your application. So there you go. That's the information you need in order to have an updating tiles and notifications to your application. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar on Metro development with Embarcadero Prism XE 2.5. Here are some useful URLs for you. First of all, be sure and register your Prism XE 2.5 serial number with rimobjects.com and that will give you access to support, downloads, and betas and gammas from Rim Objects directly. Be sure and get the May update to do all the stuff that we saw in this webinar today. The examples will eventually be included with Embarcadero Prism, but for now you can visit blogs.rimobjects.com and check out blog post 4399, and that will have all the examples in there. Also, the documentation is available at wiki.oxygenlanguage.com. There will, it will eventually be more uh, Metro documentation out there, and then you can get more videos at rimobjects.com slash TV where we cover uh, oxygen language programming on a number of different uh, fronts, so check Check that out. And uh, until next time, this has been Jim McKee through Objects Software. Thank you very much.